Well, Brother Morgan found himself all by himself this morning. <laughs> well, he done a good job for us. I don't know all the explanations, but uh, Brother Perkins and Brother Burke seem to be missing this morning. And uh, Brother Morgan looking after a lot of stuff here. We appreciate it uh, very much. Amen. That's special we just had, as I was just speaking to Brother Chris Gillum there. Uh, see, Scott, Scotty, are you back there? Yeah. First trip we made to Israel, went down to Viva La Dorsa, or however you say it, the way of the cross. And we had a lady in our party that could really hit the high notes good, like we heard this morning. And, and uh, while we were on what they have marked out as the way of the cross, the way Jesus carried the cross through the city and outside the Calvary. And uh, that was a great, uh, great moment for us to actually be there ourselves where he walked and where he carried the cross. And uh, really feel the Spirit of God witnessing to you when you go over there to some of those places like the empty tomb and some of those places. And that reminded me of it. Appreciate the special this morning. Sure do. John chapter 3. I know I've kind of got into it a little bit, but we're still going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through the book of John. Hadn't gotten very far. As Brother Kevin told you last week, I accuse you of not listening fast enough. <laughs> but truth is, truth is, I sometimes chase a rabbit. Y'all know what that means? Used to have a bird dog. Now, that don't mean a dog that flies. It means one that would point birds out to you, so you call it a bird dog. But a uh, good dog, really smart dog, but I had to teach it, don't chase rabbits. Now, I've never learned that lesson myself. <laughs> Go after the main thing. <laughs> don't get sidetracked. But... When you pastor as long as I have, you're bound to have a lot of stories, amen? And God's got a point in many of those stories. Sometimes you can repeat them and help folks. I've had a lot of stories. Now, I never have had a relative eaten by cannibals yet. <laughs> and a few other things I've heard from that source, amen? <laughs> But who knows? They're not, all my relatives are not dead yet. Some of them still, <laughs> some of them still hanging on barely uh, here and there. Somebody said something about old age this morning. I said, look, I'm better. I'm not good as I used to be, but I'm not hurting like I was for a while either. So it makes you appreciate how you're doing, doing right now. Amen. Uh, so old age is sort of like a uh, I don't know. I, rem I remember in my old hot rod days when you lost control of the car it seemed to speed up. The ultimate end of it was going to be a crash. And that's kind of what old age is. <laughs> I've lost control. It's gaining speed. And it's going to crash if the Lord don't hurry up and come rescue me. Amen. <laughs> so some of you know what I'm talking about. Somebody says it's like a snowball going down the hill and the near the end, the faster it gets. Now, I don't know much about snow, so I know more about hot rods. <laughs> Amen. But I can tell the old age thing is not letting up. It is pushing pretty hard. Got nothing to do right now with John chapter 3. So I hope you got your Bible open to John chapter 3 with us this morning. Great chapter, of course. So many, all the chapters are great. But John chapter 3, of course, we first think of John 3, 16. And we talked to you the other day. I I've spoke to the college, spoke here last Sunday morning as Brother Parsons was gone. Uh, but I uh, mentioned to you there that uh, we were talking on the, on the example of Abraham offering Isaac, remember? And uh, talked to you about that and how that the first mention of love in the Bible, after 22 chapters, love is finally the word love is used in your King James Bible, but when it's talking about the love of Abraham for Isaac. So as great as the love story is, man to woman, woman for a man, a mother for a baby, 
still the greatest example in the Bible of love is still a father for a son. And that was depicted in uh, Abraham offering Isaac. God uh, let the angel hold his hand. But see, that was a picture of the time God the Father would give his son. It was a picture of the Lord giving up the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible, as Brother Mann talked to you last week, and so it's, it's just no book like it. And how it not only gives you the straight truth and simple words, it gives you pictures that depict the truth right on through from cover to cover. How it all fits together. And uh, anybody that says, oh, I don't believe the Bible's the Word of God, tells you they don't know much. That's all there is to it. Before I was saved, I said that to my grandma. I'd get ready to go out racing. Uh, I'd go to about a weekend of two or three races, and... and uh, She'd get that old King James Bible with no cover on it and sit close to the door. And the closer I got to her, the more she read it. And the more she read it and her lips mumbled. I knew she was reading it at me. <laughs> and you know what? I'd say some dumb things. I've heard so many dumb things after I've gotten to ministry. I was an unsaved young man. And I'd say, Grandma, don't read that book at me. Some man wrote that book. But I was, <laughs> I was short of a full load, I'm going to tell you. My elevator was not going to the top. <laughs> I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> but the truth was, that book bothered me whether I knew what it, whatever I said about it. And I want to tell you folks, when you're witnessing to a loved one or talking to your friend, I don't believe the Bible. Tell them what it says anyway. They probably believe it a lot more than they say it, and they do. Because I used to, I remember I'd sometime be taking that, Parade lap before the flag would start, start racing, you know, before they'd drop it. And uh, you'd be surprised what would be in your mind sometime. Your, your adrenaline's flowing. You're all excited. But you, you also got a little fear in there. I don't care what anybody says. There's a little fear hanging in there, too. And uh, <clears throat> in my mind, I'd see Grandma sitting at the door <laughs> reading the old Bible. And I'd think, why in the world does that book bother me like that? <laughs> You heard me say that before. I used to say I, I remember a particular school teacher that made us study Shakespeare. Oh, I didn't like that. <laughs> Memorize some Shakespeare stuff. And uh, I thought, well, I've read all, I've read, done a lot of reading. Yeah, you'd do a lot of reading because we didn't have TV, amen. You'd read more too if you didn't have one. But, uh, I'd think, why does that book bother me? I've read Shakespeare. He didn't bother me. He definitely bored me, <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, go to John chapter 3 before I chase another rabbit here. John chapter 3 has got the new birth in it. Now, let's go back to chapter 2 and look at the last verse or two of chapter two, because it kind of gives you the foundation behind or truth behind what's fixing to take place here with Nicodemus and the, uh, his coming to Jesus to hear about the new birth. So we read where the Lord Jesus is talking here, and he says, <clears throat> and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. You know, that, that's an amazing thing, the depravity of man. Jesus, you know, unlike today, everybody, somebody says, you know, a man writes a biography of himself. He tells the good stuff. He leaves out the bad. The difference in the Bible, it tells the whole story about us. Somebody said the good, bad, and the ugly. It tells the whole, whole truth about us. And that's why I've said on, on, on the Bible that man wouldn't have written it if he could because it would tell the truth on him. Right. And he couldn't have written it if he would, but he wouldn't because he, he don't expose, he don't, uh, those things we would want to hide. And the truth is the Bible tells it all. All the great stuff about King David, but yet it tells the sin too. And so that's, that's the truth of the Word of God. Needed not that any should testify a man. Now, I uh, to again say something about the story here of Nicodemus coming by night to the Lord. Uh, 
he was a religious man. As far as the people on the street and the people that knew him and the neighbors that live side of him, they'd say, hey, that's a good man. That's a religious man. He was a Pharisee. He knew the law. He was, he was living his life. He was governed by that. He was doing the best he could. So he, why didn't the Lord just choose an old drunk off the street? He wanted to show us the truth here. The best man could do was what Nicodemus was doing. He was a Pharisee keeping the law the best. He was, as far as the pushing of what's in man, the Lord picked a good one to make an example out of and yet telling him, that's all you've done, all your religion, all your Phariseeism comes short. You've got to be born again. With that thought in mind, sometimes when you're reading the Lord dealing with the Pharisees and them trying to trip him up in his language and all, all the criticism they had of him, uh, when, when you hear that, it's, Kind of imagine the conversation. It seems like the Lord is kind of hostile to them, that he speaks back to them very crudely. He did that right here with Nicodemus. Nicodemus here, is, uh, as we look at it here, we can see that he's uh, kind of proud of himself. The Pharisees did have this thing of pride. He was a ruler of the Jews, it says in verse 1. And uh, he comes kind of buttering the Lord up here, calling him rabbi. Now the Lord uh, he, he says, you're a teacher come from God, but the Lord didn't say, thank you for the compliment. See, he, the issue was not that he was a teacher from God. He was God come to teach. Big difference. And so <clears throat> here we have Nicodemus here uh, coming to him. And uh, then the Lord cuts to the chase where the tire meets the road. And what, what does he say to him here? He tells him, you must be born again. You know that still shocks people today. They start telling you about their church membership or their deeds or the good things they've done or what their name represents or who they are. If you go into heaven, you must be born again. I've had the experience of some Jehovah's Witness coming to my door. Uh, they know where the, I live through the years, but some of them did it on purpose. Some of them got there by accident. <laughs> But I didn't shut the door in their face. I'm glad to talk to them because they need to get born again. Amen. Amen. And uh, that kind of cuts, cuts to the chase with them. Except a man be born again, he tells him in verse 3. Born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's still shocking news. We've heard testimonies here in the last few weeks since our soul went in marathon. Uh, young people in college students and others talking about the conversations they've had when they went out soul winning and knocking, knocking doors. And you'll find so many people will start giving you their pedigree of what church, how faithful they are, or what deeds, or what their philosophy is. But to bring them back down to the ground where the tire meets the road, you ask them if they've been born again. If you died today, do you know you'd go to heaven? I'll get back to the verses here in a minute, maybe, but uh, I remember years ago, we were having one of the beginning of the college year, or I believe it was, it was, it was the beginning of the college year, and we got new students in from various directions, and uh, of course, as Brother Morgan preached to us the other night, so rightfully so, churches are not uh, preaching enough to kids about getting them prepared to want to go into full-time service and go to a good Bible college and all that is not what it used to be. But I remember a pretty good number in the class that particular year. And I was, we were teaching the module courses then and I was teaching the module on soul winning. And I found out out of that class, I don't know what I'm talking about, but probably a dozen Young men that surrendered to come and trained to be preachers or missionaries. By the time I got through teaching personal evangelism, soul winning, almost a dozen had gotten saved. <laughs> I mean, you say, they, they've been in a good church and they came to Bible college, yes, but they had missed it. They had gotten religion, they had gotten rules, they had gotten standards, they had gotten a lot of stuff, but they were missing the main thing. They had to be born again. You say, 
What happened? Well, when they began to understand the Word of God, they saw they were lost. And uh, <laughs> that's still the hard thing for a religious man to admit. Nicodemus didn't come looking on how to be saved. He may have been under conviction. Some people talk about, well, he came by night. Well, maybe he was under conviction and couldn't wait till daylight. I don't know. Or maybe secretly because he was a Pharisee. He didn't want folks to know I'm going out to that street preacher. <laughs> Hearing what he has to say. Maybe it was his pride. <clears throat> the Pharisees had plenty of pride. <clears throat> no doubt about that. But nevertheless, he got some news he wasn't expecting. No matter how good you are, you're not, you're not saved. You're not going to heaven on your goodness. And that's still a shocker to religious people uh, today. To kind of pick up then where we uh, left off, uh, verse 5 again. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but the water is not baptism. Right in the context here, the water is talking about the fleshly birth, the human part of it. The ladies know this for sure. Uh, water is involved in the natural birth. Jesus is going to say right here that this born of flesh is flesh, and that is born of spirit is spirit, and the flesh birth is your first birth, is your natural birth. And... Uh, you know, uh, I was more fearful when our baby was getting closer to being born than my wife was. I heard stories about some lady's water breaking, <laughs> and I had all kind of fears uh, like that. And uh, the truth is, you, you remember those days, but the natural birth, the natural birth. And so you need more than being born once. You need to be born twice. Uh, if you're going to ha have, a, you know, uh, if you're going to have that life of the Lord, you've got to be born again as Jesus said so. Now, you know, that very statement through history, if you read about it, has caused revival to break loose in, in England and in America, early America. George Whitfield and some of the old preachers, no telling how many times George Whitfield Phil just got up and preached what I've just been reading here out of, the, out of the text. Just you must be born again. You must be born again. And uh, the old preachers that uh, did that. Most of you know the song. We sang it almost every invitation. Just as I am without one plea. But that, that blood was shed for me. Uh, that song alone was written by a lady that was very religious. For as she was very high society. Up in the, in the high levels of the society of England back when uh, uh, England itself was very proud of, of its high uh, standing in, in, uh, in culture and so forth. And she, were, she, she had a uh, great voice and was used to sing the, and many of them were religious songs, but uh, songs that people would buy tickets and go out, sort of opera type stuff, high, high class in, in, in England. But an old preacher from America that had been a street preacher, walked almost everywhere he went in his early years. You can still go up through Georgia and Alabama and, and some of those states and find side the road plaques still to Lorenzo Dow, the uh, itinerant preacher that walked everywhere he went, wore a suit till it fell off his body just about, till some Christian might say, hey, I'm buying you a new suit. Uh, Y'all... <laughs> I say you ought to read his story. It is a, a biography of him that is tremendous. See, I'm chasing a rabbit. I remember reading where he said uh, he, he'd camp out in the woods, sleep in the woods, walk all the way from, from uh, uh, the northern states down. He'd tell a crowd, like if he was preaching in Georgia, he'd say, now, three months from now, I'll be back here. And sure enough, he would. They could set their calendar by it. Lorenzo Dow, he was quite a character. But uh, I believe he was the one that somehow in his older years and somebody sent him over to England, a trip, paid for it. And uh, he heard this beautiful voice, this lady that was going to sing, and she sang some hymns and stuff. So he was in her 
audience when she sang. And people going to her, congratulating her, maybe getting autographs so on. But he walked up to her and he asked her, said, you've been born again? <laughs> Are you really saved? And she was insulted. I've asked a few folks and insulted them a few times in my life. Oh, another rabbit I could tell you about a college professor, but I won't. <laughs> anyway, she was highly offended that somebody would say that to her, insinuate that she needed to be saved, that she was not on her way to heaven. But that night she couldn't sleep. She couldn't get out of her mind what the preacher had said to her. And before the morning light, she got out of her bed and got on her knees and prayed the sinner's prayer, as he had said to her. And then she wrote the song, Just As I Am Without One Plea. My religion won't do it. Keeping all the rules won't do it. Getting baptized won't do it. Being a good neighbor won't do it. You got to be born again. And that's what Jesus said here. You must be born again. And of course, this was a little bit of a shock. Now, somebody's asked me, and they said, well, did, did Nicodemus get saved? Well, yes, he did. Now, right here in the text, you could say, did he accept what Jesus said? Did he get saved? But his name shows up a couple of more times, remember? And even at the crucifixion, when all the crowd, by the way, we're seeing that crowd on the streets now. The anti-Semitism, these universities are, listen, listen, I'm going to just divert one statement here. What we're seeing on the streets now, and the mobs, that was all, that's, that's the product they produced out of the classroom. It just moved out to the streets to show what they were. They are already teaching that. The philosophy didn't just happen with October the 7th when they attacked on Israel. That crowd was already brainwashed. That agenda was already there. And parents that send their, especially Christian parents, if you're really saved, you got no business sending your kid to a college that is going to attack God in the Bible. Amen. Plainly, plainly. You say, well, they need to get a secular education. Is that right? You look and see what their track record is. They're more likely to come out if they're not coming out hooked on drugs. They've come out hooked on a wrong philosophy that'll hurt them as long as they live and maybe shorten their life. But what we're seeing now is the devil's philosophy out on the streets. Anti-God, anti-Bible is what's pouring out on our streets right, right now. It's amazing. I get off of it, but you, you see it. You, you know what's uh, going on. There's no, no doubt about it. But just like, I believe her name was Charlotte Elliott that wrote, J Just As I Am, without one plea. But anyway, as she came to the realization, religion don't get you to heaven. Here was a religious Pharisee uh, as keeping the law among the crowd that knew him and the Pharisees that said, hey, that's a good man. Being good in the eyes of man don't get you to heaven. That's a very relative standard. Somebody may think you're good, and, you're, and the other guy may think you're bad doing the same thing. You can't go on man's judgment. you got to go on what the Lord says about the thing. Amen? So he told this religious man here, and, and he chose, and I, think, I, I think the Lord said, let's show people that religious rules don't get you to heaven. He could have picked a drunk. He could have picked a harlot. He could have picked somebody else. And we said, oh, and we we're prone about this. Yeah, the man in the gutter, the dope addict, he needs Jesus. So does the man on top of the hill in the big mansion. You see, the, the ground is level at the cross, somebody said. It means everybody's got to come the same way, the one way, and Jesus is the way. We heard that in the song this, this morning even. Anyway. He said here, and then he gives the illustration. Now the new birth, the first birth has to do with water. The new birth is spirit. You're born of the flesh one time. The second time you're born of the spirit. And if you don't quite understand that, you'll, you'll, you'll be off on your, on your truth. Now, 
I go back to chapter 2 in the last verse 25 there where the Lord said he knew what was in man. What is in man? Man is depraved. That's why sometimes somebody that everybody says is bad does something good. And sometimes everybody says that's good and then they see him doing bad. That's, the flesh is capable of going from one side to the other. If you don't have the Spirit of God leading you, and by the way, He will lead you. He won't force you to do right. He'll let you know what is right and wrong. To be born of the Spirit is to have the Holy Spirit of God move in. He's the policeman on the inside that says, hey, that's not your place there. You don't belong there. No, yeah, that's the wrong crowd. You're saying the wrong thing. That's the Holy Spirit of God. Now, we listen to Him, but we can overrule Him. We can say, no, I'm going to do it anyhow. Yeah, we can be presumptuous. There's such a thing as a presumptuous sin. I'm going to presume God understands what you really say it is, I want to do it. <laughs> the flesh wants to do it. It feels good to do it. So all those things, that's the age that, that we live in right now. Somebody said man is depraved. Said, what does that mean? It means he's crippled too high for crutches. You ever hear that statement? It means his thinking's not right. Or his thinking is what the flesh wants instead of what God's Spirit wants. And we all have to fight that battle. We have two natures after we get saved. Before we get saved, we are pretty well busy with what one nature wanted us to do, or what we thought was acceptable with our friends, maybe our family. But after we get born again, a conflict sets up between good and evil within us, doing right, doing wrong. So how do I know that's wrong? I've had people through the years come to counsel with me. And uh, I found out in a short while they came to get me to agree with what they had already decided to do. Yep. Isn't that amazing? Make me feel better that I've made the right decision, even though the Holy Spirit inside of me is saying, it's not right. I want the preacher to agree with me. Preachers have pressures put on them like that, you know. I've asked some folks sometime, I said, well, what did God tell you? And it kind of, see, I know he's already told them. They didn't want to hear it, so they come to get a second opinion. <laughs> One that agrees with them, amen. But what did God tell you? Well, how was God going to speak to me? Well, you've been reading the Word, been in God's Word, in it. Well, Dr. Lee Robertson been in heaven a long time now, but he, had a, he was famous for a statement uh, many times. He'd say it takes three to th thrive, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. He'd say, when I start to counsel with somebody, I ask them, are you faithful at church? Are you faithful reading your Bible? Are you f and he says, I find out pretty soon, no. So they're, they're running from God's answer, and they want you to agree with their wrong answer. And, of course, human nature. That's why the Lord says he knew what was in man. Let, let me say this. I don't know if I, I don't want to take time to turn to it. I believe you could probably find what I'm about to say. Um, trying to think right, right uh, where. Uh, the Lord Jesus, I believe it was probably is Luke 11. Don't turn to it now. He made this statement. He was talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And he gave an example how that uh, if you love your, your son, you won't, and he asks for a fish, you won't give him a serpent, that kind of thing. And then he said to the disciples that was listening, his disciples, the ones closest to him, he said, if ye then be evil. Do you understand what the Lord was saying? He was saying... These are the men on earth. I have chosen them. They're the closest to me. And yet in their nature and in their flesh, they're still evil. Even his disciples. If ye then be evil, know how to give good things. How much more the Lord will give you the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. Now think about that a minute. The Lord said the best people I know walking on this earth that have already accepted me. They're in my group in their flesh. They're still evil. That's a hard truth. The world don't like that. The polished civilization don't like that. But that's the truth. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one, the Word says. 
And that's a hard thing. That's what Nicodemus here. He came, he probably deep in his heart had some conviction, but he was going to take care of that if the Lord will pat me on the back and say, you've really been doing good. I'm proud of you. But he didn't get that, did he? <laughs> he got the truth. He got the truth. Oh, listen, folks, we all got that in us. I learned a long time ago, watch out for the one that's buttering you up. Pretty soon they're going to stick the knife in. <laughs> Amen. You better watch that business. Don't let it go to your head. Amen. And uh, here we find that Nicodemus gets the truth. You must be born again. You must be born again. And uh, he needs the new birth. Uh, and here in verse 5, born of water, first birth, born of the Spirit, second birth. It's not water, baptism. Uh, I've often said this, you can be baptized till you know every tadpole by his first name and die and go to hell. Baptism don't do it. Water don't wash away your sins. Only the blood of Jesus can do that. And we have to be careful because we can start thinking, well, I'm not bad as he is. God don't measure you by anybody else. Right. Measures you by the perfection of his son. And we all come short. We all come short. The new birth is by the word. I will ask you to go to this scripture. Go with me over First Peter. Go on over to First Peter chapter 1 for just a little bit of time left here. 1 Peter chapter 1, pick it up with me. Let's start in verse 23. We might read all three verses of the last of this chapter, 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 23, being born again. That's the subject here we're on. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed incorruptible seed. Now, corruptible seed is what? That's the natural way. That's the depraved way. That's man's flesh. Corruptible seed. Incorruptible seed is involved in the new birth. Not the first one. You're not, you're not born sinless. Yeah. You've heard this illustration. It's true. And even the Bible says that even an infant or a newborn babe comes forth basically telling lies. I'm paraphrasing that. How many of you mothers ever remember a baby crying when there wasn't nothing wrong with it? It wanted attention. It was lying to you. There wasn't no monster in the room. <laughs> it might have been hungry, legitimately crying, but a lot of times just crying for attention, which would have been lying, saying, Mama, come, something's happening to me. No, just the old nature showing up. Corruptible seed. Peter says over here, being born again. Not of corruptible seed, not of the flesh, but of incorruptible. What seed is incorruptible? God's. The seed of the woman that produced the Lord Jesus Christ in the virgin birth. And to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and to be born again, you're born again by incorruptible seed. Incorruptible seed. And it says, but of incorruptible, verse 23 here. By the word of God, word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You know, we're studying a living book. <laughs> this is God's word. <laughs> Man, <laughs> you know why I got born again? I heard the gospel. I heard the word. I heard the story of Jesus. I heard how he loved me while I was yet a sinner and how he died for me on the cross. What was I hearing? I was hearing the word of God, the incorruptible word of God. Never got away from it. There's people that come to this church this, inside this building or listen on the radio. And a uh, long time, they can't get away from it. What they need to do is come and settle it by receiving the Lord and getting born again. Still looking for another way. I, I remember visiting a man on his deathbed. He knew he was on his deathbed. He was scared. He knew he was going to die. He'd been to my church several times. He'd heard the gospel plainly. Remember it very well. And he said, all I got against you folks down at the church is you're too plain. <laughs> that's the words he used. You're too plain. I said, well, that's where you felt then. How you feel now? <laughs> Big difference when he knew he didn't have much time. He literally was trembling in fear. 
And of course, thank God I went over it with him, and I hope he was sincere, really getting saved, but he sure had pushed it to the end. He didn't last much longer than that. But it wasn't that he didn't know all that time. He was looking for another way to dodge it, another way to get by it. But when it finally came now, no more time to fool around, no more time to procrastinate, no more time to put it off. Maybe like the thief on the cross, he made it. I can't say. I hope so. At least the incorruptible seed was spoken to him again. Amen. And if you're going to get born again, you get born again by hearing the Word of God. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That's the gospel. And when you hear the Word of God, and this is the reason as Christians and believers, we need to get folks within the sound of the hearing of the Word of God. Listen, I can't save anybody, and neither can you. But we can get them to where, hopefully get them, if, it, if it's out of friendship or however we're able to do it, get them on the sound of the incorruptible seed. Then the Holy Spirit of God can cause a new birth to play, take place inside. And I want to tell you, that's exactly how you got saved and how I got saved. I've watched it in the church through the years. I've watched it with young people. I've seen them. My wife and I said, so-and-so's under conviction. A week or two later, they got saved, thank God. But we already saw it coming. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Maybe that's your story, certainly. Truth of the matter is, the new birth is a necessity. It's not just another religious thing to do. It's a must. It says you must be born again. All right, we see what Brother Smith's going to report here. Oh, 883, not so bad. But anyway, stay with us about eight or nine minutes here, and the choir will be coming out, though I don't know who's leading it this morning. <laughs> I know who it's not. <laughs>